All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 28. Let's go to the next one. It says here, But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, the group of people, and let him speak to himself and to God. It's people. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 35. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. You have a meeting of Christians coming together. It's the men, the elders, that are supposed to be leading and, and speaking and things and saying, okay, today we're going to be learning about uh, the thing of baptismal regeneration, why it's not scriptural. Baptismal regeneration, if you don't know, is baptizing inf infants. They have the stain of original sin, and when you baptize them by dunking them under the water like Greek Orthodox or you know, pouring holy water <laughs> on their head like a Catholic, and that somehow has removed the, the stain of original sin, this baptismal regeneration, and it, and it introduces them into the system of witchcraft. I, I meant the church. Excuse me, just a slip of the tongue there. Yeah. And it is, you know, they do the same thing there in witchcraft. I'm not, I'm being sarcastic, but telling some truth along with it. So the church comes together and the men, the elders are the ones that are supposed to be telling the people and instructing them, teaching them the word of God. Again, why? So that the church can move out. So that now it's, you say, okay, brother so-and-so, you've learned the Bible well. You've shown that you've been faithful. You're this, you're that. We want to send you and brother so-and-so here over to that area over there and witness to the people, get a people established in the word. You'll start your church there, you know, where you're at. I'm in Bridgewater right now. Okay, Bridgewater, Maine. Now, if we had a bunch of people coming together here and things, and then we would, you know, have a couple elders ordained, and then we'd say, okay, brother so-and-so and brother so-and-so, I want to send you up to Presque Isle. Brother so-and-so, brother so-and-so, we're going to go down, you're going to go down to Holton or wherever. See? Brother so-and-so is okay. Your Things are going good. All right, let's send some people to New Hampshire. Let's send some people over to, to Nova Scotia. Let's send some people down to... That's how it spreads out. But you come together to teach and to preach, not for evangelism. Right? The purpose of the church is, is not to evangelize the lost within the church. That was a conditional thing if the church comes together and an unbeliever walks in. It's not saying, welcome the unbelievers in, make it about the unbelievers coming in. You're not to fellowship with unbelievers. Right? The church comes together to receive edification, to pray for each other, to to share things and, and say as far as, uh, hey, you know, here's some gospel tracts I made. Oh, great, let's get these distributed or, or whatever. That's the purpose of the church coming together, all right, to train each other up so that they can go out into the lost world and get people saved and then bring them into the church. You know, again, this stuff should be reorganized. You know, and don't look to me to be the, the guy that I'm going to start the movement or something like this. You know, there's other brethren out there that need to be doing this stuff. I mean, I'm in video ministry. That's what I'm doing. We put out free video for people and say we make no charge for it. I mean, I used to make DVDs and things, and it was just like, you know, it's very difficult because a lot of my studies are just over the limit of what you can really fit well onto a DVD. So I'm, I've been struggling with this thing now for a while and just like to make hard copies. You know, I know, I know a lot of the brethren do. Um, they just put together stuff and things, and I'm just like, I don't know how on earth to get back to doing something like that. It's kind of a future project. I mean, like I said in another video, we're restructuring the ministry right now, so that might happen in the future. But my whole point is, um, I don't want to become some kind of a, a pope that dictates things and whatever else. Um, you know, if the Lord eventually has us offline and we're meeting with people, we have the time to do that and and things and, and you know, we can ordain elders and send them out into other areas and things like this, fine. That's the way it should be. But some of you that have really, you know, studied under this ministry and other ministries, you know, many witnesses in other words, and you know the Bible well, uh, be open to the Lord telling you to start a house church, right? to start a, a meeting of Christians. It doesn't have to be in a home, okay, but don't get some building where you're mortgaged to the building and then the government expects you to have their 501c3 status and, and the whole deal, you're open to the public and then you have to abide by federal government guidelines because you're a public building. 
That stuff is unscriptural, and it leads to problems. But we'll continue. And by the way, there, another point I've made in the past, this thing of 1 Corinthians 14, verse 35, is women are supposed to ask their husbands at home if they have questions. So does that mean that men should hire a pastor that preaches things and they just answers all the questions? No, men are supposed to be strong leaders in their homes and answer their wives' questions or their children's questions. Again, how many people that go to these church buildings, how many people do that? Oh, you have a question about the Bible, honey? Call a preacher. That's I pay his salary to do that. Hmm. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9 is the next one. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He persecuted the people. And it's ironic because if you read over in Acts, well, let's go there. Just keep your hand there in 1 Corinthians 14. We're going to be, well, 15 actually. We're going to be coming back there. Go to the book of Acts. I want to get the scripture. I'm going to take my time today. We're going to hit a lot of scriptures. I tend to rush through things. But to Acts chapter 9. Uh, verse 3, we'll start there. It says, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, uh, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. All right, in other words, when he's saying kick against the pricks, it's like saying, you know, you're doing something bad. It's like, you know, there's a bunch of spears or whatever and you're, you're kicking them things, you know. Uh, it's, it's, you're trying to kick, he's persecuting the church, but it's ending up hurting him, is what the Lord's trying to say. But notice, he, the Lord does not say, why persecutest thou my church? He says, why persecutest thou me? But over here in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9, I persecuted the church of God. So the church... Jesus equates it to himself. He says, why persecutest thou me? Acts chapter 9, verse... Uh, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Verse 5. Verse 4, why persecutest thou me? So verse 4 and verse 5, Jesus is saying, you're persecuting me. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9, I persecuted the church of God. The church is Jesus Christ on the earth. There's a thought. Are you in church? Better think about that. But let's continue. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19. You know, this is not a uh, real interesting going from verse to verse study and seeing how scriptures all tie together. I mean, there's a little bit of that in this study, but and this is just a deep study of the scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19. Kind of like when we went through the thing of tribulation, the word tribulation and tribulations. Okay, it says here, The churches of Asia salute you, Aquila and Priscilla salute you, much in the Lord, with the church that is in their house. Hmm. Well, you see, that's because at first they didn't have the money for a good building. You know, later on, after the Bible, after the New Testament was written, then the Christians were safer, and then they had, were more prosperous, so then they built church buildings. No, they did not. Next, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. It says here, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia. People, not a building. Galatians 1.13. Galatians chapter 1, verse 13. It says here, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past and the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Very clearly the people, not a building. Ephesians, the book of Ephesians is your next reference to the word church. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22 says here, And hath put all things under his feet, 
and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, the people. In other words, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Buildings don't know anything. It's the people. Ephesians 3, verse 21. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Glory in the church. The people. Ephesians 5.23 For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now see, that's a mistranslation, because you see, the head of the church is the IRS, through 501c3. No, the head of the church is Jesus Christ, if you're in a real church, anyhow. If you're in a, a fraudulent, government-run uh, ba uh, Babel building, excuse me, then uh, yeah, that... The head of the, your church is not Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5.24. And you know, they'll, they'll come out and they'll say, Well, Jesus said that we're to render, under, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and under God the things that are God's. You know, so we have to pay taxes and blah, blah, blah. And, and of course, the easy answer to that is, so then you're saying, Babel building supporter, that the church is Caesar's. Was, what was Caesar again? He was a Roman. Uh, what did Constantine later become? Pontifus, Pontifus Maximus. Did I get that right? Pontificus Maximus, whatever. What did he become? Uh, basically, the first pope. You know, if you want, if you want a uh, um, pope in the uh, first century, it wasn't Peter; it was Caesar, the political ruler of Rome. Constantine became the political slash religious ruler. They merged it. That's the history of the Catholic Church. They were just Roman, the Roman Empire merged into a religion. But uh, let's continue here. Verse 24, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, not the government, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. I know some of the brethren try to make their little church buildings, you know, without blemish, but uh, it's not what the Lord intended. Uh, let's go to the next one, verse 29. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the Lord, the church. Verse 30, For we are members of His body, of His flesh, and of His bones. Again, if you are in Christ, then you are in church. I got into a big argument with a Baptist years and years ago, and he was like, what about when you're in, shower, in the shower? Are you in church then? And I said, yes, I'm in church all the time. And he just had this, just, he was just mortified by this. You know, How could you say such things? Crazy. Verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Hmm. Very interesting. Have you left your uh, mother earth? You know, or the, the fatherland that you were born in? <laughs> you know, have you left the world? Are you a called out assembly, much like the Jews from the Old Testament were called out of the world in type Egypt and brought out, and they're the church in the wilderness? Hmm. Philippians chapter 3. Let's go to the next one. Try to get through these things here. Philippians chapter 3, verse 6. Concerning zeal persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is, of, which is in the law, blameless. He's persecuting people, not a building. Philippians chapter 4, verse 15. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if, any, and if in any thing ye be otherwise minded. Did I read that right? Oh, I'm sorry, that's 3.15, sorry. 
Philippians 4, 15. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Group of people meeting in an area. It has nothing to do at all with the building itself. Colossians 1.18 Colossians 1.18, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. All things, Jesus Christ is supposed to have the preeminence. How is that possible when you are in a government-incorporated church? And they tell you what you can and cannot say in regards to elections and anything that affects public policy. And now because you're a public place, you are now responsible to follow the laws, the uh, thing of the sodomites being able to use whatever bathroom they want because you're open to the public. How can Jesus Christ have the preeminence when you have a building like that? He can't. Something to think about there. All right. Colossians 1.24 Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my body or in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Again, we see this thing over and over and over again. We see this thing that the church is Christ's body. It's not a dead building someplace. And yet, why is why is there such a a worship of these buildings? It's pagan. That's what it is. All right, Colossians chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. We're going to see the next two references to the word church. Colossians 4, verse 15. Salute the brethren which are, which are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church which is in his house. There's that word again. And when this epistle is read among you, calls that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Laodicea. Interesting. All right, next we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Is it not obvious yet, you know? <laughs> I realize that, you know, a lot of the, uh, go next to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. I know a lot of the uh, brethren have already tuned out a long time ago because they'll say, well, yes, I know that the word church is, is never a reference to the building. It's always a reference to the people and blah, blah, blah. You know, uh, so you're just wasting your time. Well, it's never a waste of time to read the Bible. All right. Uh, secondly, I just want to get this thing firmly put into your mind as a Christian. Because, see, this... There could eventually be laws passed, like Vladimir Putin, Pukin, you know, over there in Russia, saying you're not allowed to witness, you're not allowed to talk about the Lord, you're not allowed to email, you're not allowed to talk about him on the phone, you're not allowed to do anything unless you are in a church. State approved, of course. Got to have that. You see, then they can keep uh, tabs on you. Know what I mean? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. People, not a building. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. Talking about the qualifications for a bishop. It says here, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? The people. Jump down to verse 15 of the same chapter. Here's a, here's a good one. Okay, this is another one that the uh, Babel building people will use. We'll look at it, what it actually says here. 1 Timothy 3.15 But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And they'll say, see, how can you behave yourself in people? It's the house of God. Okay, 
but it defines it right in the text. That thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. The pillar and ground of the truth. What's the church of the living God? I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. What is it? It's the body of Christ. So you can't use this scripture and say somehow you divorce the two. The church of the living God meets in the house of God. No, it's not talking about that. We're built up into a spiritual house as Christians. We come together to worship. Again, this is not a proof text for some kind of a building someplace. And if it was, then why does it say that it's the pillar and ground of the truth? God never told you to build a building and never told people to invite lost people into it to get them saved and stuff because we're having a revival meeting or something like this. That's not the truth. So if the building is somehow representative of, you know, this, this verse is representing buildings, well, it's, that would cause a major contradiction because it's not the pillar and ground of the truth. There's nowhere in this scripture that says build a building and call it a church. Uh, some of you aren't going to listen, though. It's crazy. Let me look up a verse really quick here. I'm just thinking of one. Um, okay, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 20 through 22. It says here, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Jesus is the foundation, not Peter. Um, verse 21, In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. The house of God is the people coming together when they come together. That's what's going on there in 1 Timothy chapter uh, 3, verse 15. But let's look at 1 Timothy 5, verse 16. It says here, If any man or woman, woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. All right. I know it's a fun practice to have a corporation that can be sued to protect the people's assets and things like this. <laughs> you know, study those laws sometime. But uh, it's talking here about this, this, you know, verse, verse 16 there, you know, let not the church be charged. It's just simply saying the people within that group of people there, they shouldn't be charged with somebody's relatives that they don't want to take care of. If those relatives have family members that are within that church, they're supposed to take care of them and not bring it and put it upon a financial burden upon the people, the church. That's what it's saying. Okay, 2 Timothy. I think this is at the end here again, you know, of the... Uh, book of 2 Timothy, there's a little S there, and there's one for Titus as well. I wouldn't include these because I don't consider that little thing at the end to be inspired scripture, but that's just me. Um, it says here, 2 Timothy, at the end, it says, the second epistle unto Timotheus ordained the first bishop of the church of the Ephesians. It was written from Rome when Paul was brought before Nero the second time. Okay, again, I wouldn't really make that into scripture. A Titus, the end of it, it says, It was written to Titus, ordained the first bishop of the church of the Cretans from Nicopolis of Macedonia. I wouldn't include that, but uh, the book of Philemon, chapter 1, verse 2 says, And to our beloved Apphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. It's a problem. Only if you have a Bible building. But, um, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church, will I sing praise unto thee. All right. And I do believe that the book of Hebrews is for the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. So it's interesting because their called out assemblies are still, are actually called churches as well. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23 says, um, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Okay, So there you see the general assembly and church of the firstborn. 
right? It's a called out assembly. It's a church there. Interesting. James chapter 5, verse 14. James 5, 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. I believe a reference to the time of Jacob's trouble. But again, there's going to be a church there. A called out assembly. 1 Peter 5.13 1 Peter 5.13 says, The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus my son. Now we go to 3 John, the third epistle of John, verse 6. There's only one chapter again. 3 John, verse 6, Which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. Okay, um, charity before the church. Again, talking about people. Look at verse 9 of the same thing, the same uh, book here. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. That doesn't happen anymore now, does it? Verse 10. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. All right, And you say, well, then they're being cast out, they're losing their salvation. No, 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 no. It's, again, a reference to the people when they're coming together. So he's casting people out of that fellowship, that assembly, that called out assembly, the church. That's what he's doing. Next, let's go to Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, and walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Alright, you're going to see the seven churches here of Revelation. Revelation chapter 2 verse 8. And under the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. Another church, another group of people in an area. Um, verse 12 of the same chapter. And unto the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he, which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Alright, 2 verse 18, jump down to verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Revelation 3, 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Again, another church, another group of people. Revelation 3, verse 7. And unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. All right? People. Revelation 3, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. All right, that's the last reference to the word church. All right, now, there's a bunch of references here to churches in the plural. Go back to Acts chapter 9. We're going to get through these. Much study is a weariness to the flesh. Believe you me. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. We'll try to read through these quicker. It says here, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. How does a building walk in the fear of the Lord? It doesn't. It's the people. Acts chapter 15, verse 41. And he went throughout, or, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. Again, like I've been talking about, you get groups of Christians together, and you have men that are ordained going out and confirming them. Are you really saved? Are you in the right doctrine? Whatever. Acts chapter sixteen, verse five, and so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. 
they were established in the faith and they increased in number because they were being taught the word of God correctly. Acts 19 verse 37. There's an interesting one. Acts 19 verse 37 says here, For ye have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Interesting because this instance right here, you have a pagan worshiper of Diana, and he's actually saying that these Christians are not robbers of churches. He's referring to their pagan temples. So they were calling their pagan temples churches in the first century. And, you know, somebody's going to say, well, yeah, but the Greek word there is, is, should be better translated as temples and not churches. Oh, well, again, we're back to the argument of uniform translation. You know, you, you translate the word according to the context in which it appears. That's the right way to do it. And uh, the Lord definitely showed a prophetic thing in that statement there, that there would one day come buildings that people thought were churches. Next, let's go to Romans chapter 16, verse 4. Romans 16, verse 4. Well, we'll start at verse 3. It says here, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. That's who it's talking about here. Verse 4, Who have for the, my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Plural word for churches there that you see. It's people. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17 says here, But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so I and so ordain I in all churches. Ordaining people in churches. Groups of people, not buildings. First Corinthians chapter eleven, verse sixteen. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. People, not buildings. 1 Corinthians 14, 33 and 34. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. It's the building. Or, excuse me, not the building. It's the, uh, it's the people. Not a building. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Verse 19 of the same chapter. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Again, read that earlier. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Uh, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. People. God isn't going to bestow uh, grace you know, towards a building. It's not going to happen. Verse 18. It says here, and, and we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. Verse 19. And not that only, but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us with this grace, which is administered by us to the glory of the same Lord and declaration of your ready mind. Again, we have churches. People choosing and saying, sending people out like that. It's not buildings. Verse 23 and 24 of the same chapter. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper, helper concerning you, or our brethren be inquired of, they are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. Wherefore show ye to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. I don't think I need to say a whole lot on that one. Just very self-explanatory. It's a group of people. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 8. I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. Paul being a little bit sarcastic there. 
course, he wasn't robbing anybody. He wasn't robbing groups of people, but they were, the Corinthians are, you know, saying, you know, you're doing this for the money and all this other stuff. I get that thing put on me, you know, you're doing this for the money. And I'm like, yeah, right, you know, wrecking my health and, and I'm, you know, so tired I don't get much sleep at night sometimes. And I had about five hours of sleep last night, so my body's starting to wear out. You know, combine that with work and construction, you know, and uh, see how you do. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. Beside those things which, that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Paul must have been a janitor because he, you know, the care of all the churches. So he went around, you know, fixing the leaky sinks and, and you know, cleaning the toilets out and things. No, he was not talking about that. The care of the churches means he's taking care of people. Chapter 12, verse 13. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 13. It says here, For what is it wherein ye were inferior to other churches, except it be that I myself was not burdensome, burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. How do you burden a building? Hmm. Not a building, it's people. You understand? Uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 2. And all the brethren which are with me and to, unto the churches of Galatia. Verse 22. Galatians 1, 22. It was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ. Again, we see the thing. These people, the church of God is in Christ. We are his body. Somebody says, you know, I, I wouldn't do this in church. Well, as I said earlier, uh, then you're not saved. You're in church all the time as a Christian. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which are in Judea are in Christ Jesus, for ye have for ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Mm -hmm. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. It says here, So that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. So, again, we see it's people, not a building. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. Oh. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from God which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. All right, how can you have grace be unto you in peace from him which is and which was and which is to come? He's writing to the churches and he says, I'm writing to give you peace. Buildings can't have peace. Revelation 1 verse 11. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, what thou seest write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Revelation 1.20, there's two of these here. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the, and are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Hmm, interesting. Revelation 2, verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Another example there. Okay, uh, Revelation 2, verse 7. 
Uh, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. To him that overcometh. It's not talking about a building. It's talking about people. A church there. Chapter 2, verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. Uh, buildings can't overcome. Uh, Revelation 2, verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. There it is again. Uh, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of, or the, give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, um, saving he that receiveth it. Let me get through this. Revelation chapter two verse twenty three. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Revelation 2.29 And the, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Hmm. Revelation 3, verse 6 He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Uh, Revelation 3.13 Oh boy, he that hath an ear, uh, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Three twenty-two, Revelation three twenty-two. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Again, very similar thing there. And uh, you say, well, how many more references? Well, just one. Revelation chapter twenty-two. Keep your hand there in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine... Excuse me, let me start over there. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Now, chapter 3, verse 22, it says churches. Chapter 22, verse 16, it says, churches. Where is the churches in between there? They're not there. You know why? Because the church is gone. It's been raptured. There are no churches in the time of Jacob's trouble. Interesting. At least not by name. Now, there will be called out assemblies in that time period. Sure. Absolutely. <sighs> So that's it. We're finally through. I don't even know how many references that was. Quite a few. Um, let me just check here real quickly. But, you know, it does a it does you good sometimes to just go through the Bible like that. You know, it is a weary, weariness to the flesh. Um, okay, 80 verses for just the word church. Churches has 37 matches according to this sword searcher thing. So 80 plus 37. That's a lot of references. But we got through it. I'm about ready to pass out here. I'm tired. Um, but there are no arguments. There, There is nothing within the pages of Scripture that justifies anybody building a building. And we can go over the arguments and over the arguments and over the arguments, but quite frankly, if you're not convinced by now, um, if you're not going to be persuaded by this book, then God's going to have to do something else to get you out of those buildings. Brethren, we need to get back to the first century practices. I mean, why do you think Vladimir Putin is so worried about Christians witnessing outside of organized government churches? Because that's where the power's at. The government can't control it. But if they can get you into a church building, they got you. They can control you. Better think about that. All right. That's going to be it for this study. I need to take a break here. I uh, have some interesting stuff coming up in the future here, um, as always. But uh, just wanted to get that thing done. You know, finally 
being able to go over it. And I just want to say, you know, I'm leaving up the studies I've had from the past. And you'll hear me in those studies recommending that, hey, if you can find it, if you can still find a good Baptist church or some kind of Bible-believing church out there, I'd suggest going to it. Um, let me public, publicly uh, renounce that teaching. All right. Um, church buildings are wrong. They always have been. And uh, you shouldn't be going. Okay. I don't care if you can find one that's that's really seems to be solid and legitimate and whatever else. It's wrong. It's not in the pages of Scripture. We need to be Bible-believing Christians in all matters of faith and practice, as I've been advocating. That's what this whole thing is about. Um, but if you're not convinced, the Lord is going to convince you in the future. There's a lot of things that are going to happen to your Babel building to get you out of there. And I'm trying to warn you because I love you. Okay? So that is going to be it. I'm going to close this study now and uh, just... Don't let anybody come to you and say you're wrong because you don't go to church someplace. They have no basis in Scripture. We've been over all references to the word church. Not once is it a reference to a building. Not once. So somebody comes along and they say you're wrong for not going. Don't let them threaten you. All right? Please keep that in mind. Your Bible, your King James Bible is your final authority. Not the Baptists or the Methodists or the Catholics or whoever else. Keep that in mind. Thank you for watching.